Okay, let's start. Um, thank you all for uh, joining our session. Um, that's going to be about detecting and overcoming GPU failures during ML training. Before we start the presentation, we're going to quickly introduce ourselves. So I'm Sarah, I'm an ML platform engineer at WAVE. So WAVE is, uh, is we're UK based and our mission is to uh, solve cell driving um, using embodied AI. So as you can imagine, um, training AI models is at the core of what we do. Um, so it's super important to have efficient training um, and detect and handle um, GPU failures when they occur. Hi, I'm Ganesh, and I'm a software engineer in the Azure Kubernetes Service team at Microsoft. AKS is a managed Kubernetes service platform, and we help make it easy to run a variety of compute workloads, including ML workloads, like ML training workloads. I particularly work on GPU management within the AKS team, and I've seen a bunch of GPU errors before, and I'm happy to share about some of the insights from that experience. So here's our agenda. We're going to start with a quick introduction. Then we'll present some, uh, well, present GPU failures and the impact that they can have on ML workloads. Um, then we'll move on to uh, detection and resolution um, with a demo and conclusion. About the detection and resolution, um, Ganesh and I will present two different perspectives. So I'll have the GPU, uh, the uh, industry uh, point of view, and then Ganesh will present the cloud provider or infra provider side of things. So what can be done on that side to lighten the burden on the customer? Um, so why Kubernetes for ML training? I think we've seen um, a, a lot of these uh, throughout the uh, conference, uh, but just some uh, three key points. Uh, so Kubernetes is uh, designed for distributed systems, which is really helpful when, um, when it comes to running uh, multi-node training uh, workloads. It also has a good uh, ecosystem of job scheduling tools like Volcano, Kubeflow, uh, Q. Um, they support gang scheduling, uh, also helpful for multi-node training, so the pods get scheduled at the same time. And they also have plugins for AI frameworks, so that's configuration that gets done behind the scene for you. Uh, in order to use those AI frameworks. Uh, the last point is the GPU device plugin operator. I don't know if you joined the session about the uh, GPU operator, um, but it um, makes it really easy for you to manage all the software layer that gives you access to the different hardware components that are required for your AI training. So a little bit about GPU failures. Uh, so GPUs are very complex pieces of hardware, and they're um, much more likely to um, have failures than CPUs. Um, so this is a table from the uh, LAMA3 paper published by Meta last month, um, and they listed all the unexpected interruptions that happened during the 54-day period of the LAMA3 model pre-training. And what they uh, explain in this table is that uh, out of all the unexpected interruptions that happened, 58.7% were due to GPU issues. So it's a really um, important problem that's um, critical to um, tackle well. Uh, in terms of uh, GPU failures, uh, the, the issues, the errors can happen in different parts of the different components. Uh, it can happen at the GPU itself. Um, we're all familiar with the the GPU has fallen off the bus. Um, error uh, it can happen uh, at the GPU memory level as well. You can have networking issues uh, between the GPUs. Um, and then at the software lev level, you can also have GPU driver errors. So what impacts do uh, these issues have on the ML workloads? So the obvious one is failures. So um, failures means uh, um, the, the job actually fails, the pod terminates. But you can also have um, other impacts, uh, such as hangs. So in the case of hangs, there's no more um, useful computation that is done, and the job just hangs indefinitely uh, without terminating. Um, and you can have slowdowns as well. So slowdowns, there's still useful computations that are being done, but they're much slower. Uh, in our case, we've, we've seen examples of um, run, run, drums running six times slower than normal. Um, one thing to note is because um, in the case of distributed training, uh, even with a single uh, faulty GPU, um, 
it, this can impact an entire job running across uh, tens, thousands, uh, hundreds and thousands of, uh, of GPUs um, because of the gradient uh, synchronization. So uh, the different uh, ranks will share uh, the gradients and to average it um, and they, they will wait on each other. Uh, so that's uh, how it can impact an entire job. Um, these um, issues can be very expensive. Uh, so as a, an example, I put an example of an H100 node, for example, that has eight GPUs. Public price is $2,000 US dollars per day um, for a job that um, usually runs uh, for three days on such node. Uh, imagine it's six times slower. Um, so it will run on, uh, for 18 days instead. That's uh, initial 30,000 uh, US dollars, and that's only for one node. So I let you imagine the, the impact, the financial impact that it has um, on your, well, when um, across your infrastructure. And that's only financial, but it's also like um, longer development times as well. So um, the resolution starts with detection. So the go different goals of detections are uh, A, avoid workloads from being uh, scheduled on faulty nodes. B, uh, remove jobs from um, faulty nodes during training and reschedule them on healthy nodes. And then finally, repair or replace the faulty nodes. So there are different um, solutions for detection. So the first one is uh, node readiness. So that's detecting failures before the job starts. So the idea is using an init container that runs um, health checks um, and such as GPU bandwidth, but um, nickel tests and GPU errors. Uh, it's very useful to run uh, tests that actually use the resources because it, it, it runs ahead of the training job. And um, in the case where the health checks succeed, the, you can move on to the training uh, job container and start your training. And if the health check fail, um, the, the node is tainted um, and the pod terminates and gets um, rescheduled, but we'll see that later. Um, important to taint the node or um, any strategy to disable uh, further workloads, other workloads from being scheduled on that node. Um, the benefit of this approach is that workloads don't get scheduled uh, on uh, nodes that have um, such errors. A second approach um, solution that's complementary, it's monitoring while the jobs are running. Um, so you have health checks um, and monitoring at the node level. Um, so you run uh, health checks, GPU health checks in the background um, and you can collect metrics. So um, these um, easy to find. Um, Ganesh will touch on uh, the GPU health checks uh, later on, uh, but in terms of metrics, you can use the, for example, the DCGM, the DCGM exporter metrics. Uh, the pros um, is that they're very easy to install with the GPU operator and they can detect issues um, at a very fine level, at the GPU level. The cons is that they're very, it's very difficult with those um, metrics and health checks to uh, detect the, um, the hangs. And then you can um, do monitoring at the workload level. Uh, so that's, uh, for example, combined metrics on uh, GPU utilization and versus memory access. So we noticed that um, in some of our um, workloads when they were hanging, we, we noticed 100% uh, of GPU utilization and 0% of memory access. Um, or you can also uh, collect metrics around collective uh, operations, so how long it takes for uh, collective operations. The pros is that um, they can actually detect hangs um, sometimes. It can help you detect those uh, issues. Cons is that it's more complex to implement, so it's your custom, um, so you have to install that yourself. Um, and um, it's more difficult as well to identify the, um, which GPU is um, responsible for the hang. So, uh, it's more at the, the, the job level. Um, so a bit on the resolution. So at the job level, um, the main approach is obviously migrating the, the job. So job preemption and rescheduling. So you, you save the checkpoint. So that can be done um, automatically um, with frameworks such as PyTorch. So you can use a callback with an on exception function. And what it does is um, on an exception. So for example, when it receives a sick term, it will automatically save a checkpoint. And then the job will terminate. Um, and um, 
then you reschedule a new job on your new node, that's healthy, and then you restore from the safe checkpoint. Um, resolution at the node level, so that's a repair or replace uh, the node. So you got all the metrics and health checks that you that you run, um, you know, whether in, it was at the back in the background or at um, at the beginning of a job. And then once there's an error, you you taint the node. So that's for to prevent um, f further scheduling on that node. And then you can either, depending on the nature of the, the error, you can either take some corrective actions, which such as like reset the device, restart the driver, or reboot the node, um, run uh, health checks again, um, and then untaint if they pass, or you can uh, drain and remove the node. So that will remove the node from, from your node pool. Um, and then some cloud providers uh, prov uh, provide a functionality to add, um, mark the node as unhealthy, so it doesn't get um, re-added re later on to your um, to your node pool. That's important that, um, to know that. And that's me. I'll hand it over to Ganesh for the infra provider perspective. Thank you, Sarah. From the infra provider perspective, we want to minimize the number of steps and checks that an application layer workload needs to do. We want to take over most of the health checks that can be done at the node level or across the fleet so that customers can focus on their machine learning workloads and figure out how to maybe optimize their platform better rather than worrying about a lot of the lower level infra details. So there are many different layers in which you can do failure detection. Uh, Sarah focused on the first layer in terms of detecting at the workload layer with multiple health checks. But at the orchestrator layer, which is the area that I'll focus on in this section, we can run a variety of node health checks throughout the lifecycle of the node. And that can be combined with other tools like the K8's device plugin for GPUs for checking GPU readiness. Then there's layers before that that are also relevant, like the virtual machine deployment layer. So in this phase, you can try to predict whether the GPUs will fail based on previous workloads, for instance. And if you have other signals related to uh, latent health issues, you could also leverage that to decide whether or not the nodes can even be surfaced to the orchestrator. Then at the very initial phase, you also have testing during the onboarding of large GPU clusters where you uh, do some performance testing uh, to make sure that the set of GPUs that you've purchased are appropriate. And for most infra providers, whether or not it's cloud or, cloud or on-prem, they would go through these various layers of failure detection. For the Kubernetes case, node problem detector is a standardized way to test and monitor node health. This is the repo which is quite stable. And at a high level, node problem detector can be run either as a daemon set or a systemd unit on every node. And it's got checks to look at uh, kernel monitoring or look at the system generated logs. And you can also have additional pro problem daemons for the tests that you want to run. Then you also have another component called the remedy controller, which is paired with the node problem detector typically to be able to take action on the detections themselves. And in today's talk, I'm going to mainly focus on the open source components that you can use uh, for almost any Kubernetes environments. This is uh, an example of a healthy node uh, on an Azure Kubernetes service cluster where we are running node problem detector by default. You will see that there are a variety of node conditions that are populated on the node based on the node problem detectors test. So this is looking at things like the container runtime, whether that's up or not. So if container D goes down, then this node condition would be set to true. There's also other conditions for memory pressure and network availability, for instance. But the problem or the gap right now with node problem detector is that none of the tests are GPU specific. And we want to figure out how we can extend it to run GPU specific tests. Taking a step back, there's many ways to run GPU health checks. Uh, some could be like custom health checks based on the specific GPUs that you have and the specific configuration in your cluster. 
Uh, this has been done in the past uh, where many infra providers would, might have like customized jobs for the HPC clusters to run uh, GPU health checks. Then there's another project from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab called Node Health Checks. It's an open source project which has been there for a while. And it has integrations with multiple HPC workload managers like Slurm and Torque. And one of the main advantages is that it's reliable. It's got many timers to prevent hangs for the health checks themselves. The other advantages are that it's extensible. You can add more GPU-related health checks. And you could also reuse it across multiple workload managers. The Azure HPC health checks, which are also an open source, uh, an experimental approach, extend the LBNL node health checks to test it with a bunch of VMs which are supported in Azure. So these include some of the multi-instance GPUs from NVIDIA and also from AMD. This is an example of uh, health checks that are run as part of these uh, HPC health checks. And you can find the repo here too. And one thing to note is that the Kades device plugin from NVIDIA, for instance, already has some health checks built in, but we want to go beyond that to test things like bandwidth or you want to test things like the uh, memory errors or application-related XID errors. You can, you, can, you can actually extend it with these health checks. Uh, so here you see a table where there's expected GPU counts for particular uh, multi-instance GPUs, and you also have things like bandwidth expectations for infinite band devices, which also vary based on whether it's an A100 or an H100 or the GPU that you want to use it with. So this is a custom plugin for node problem detector, which just leverages those health checks to be able to run regularly during the node lifecycle. So node problem detector will has some configuration to say, okay, this is the, the script that I want to run. Right here, it's like checking GPU counts. And you also have multiple fields which you can use to configure it. So things like timeouts for the health checks or how frequently you want to run those health checks can be configured. Then here's another uh, example of the script for testing your uh, GPU health. So here it's looking at a variety of XID errors that are just defined here. And you can also modify it if you need to. And based on this, it's going to create node conditions. So NPD, as the output, will be creating node conditions of the node and also generating events based on the health checks. And these custom plugins are going to allow you to do it for GPU-specific checks. So NPD is doing detection, and now what do you do with those detections? You look at another component called Remedy Controller, which is just a general term for a variety of projects which are taking actions based on those detections. Uh, Drano, Medicates are some of the common open source solutions for that. But then uh, you have these two components that both need to be deployed to make sure uh, it's working as expected. And sometimes cloud providers also have their internal implementations of these remedy controllers, which allow you to take specific actions. You could restart the node, restart some of the uh, GPU driver related components, uh, and take actions based on the error that you see. And this remedy controller typically can be configured to take uh, specific actions based on the errors. And if you still have the error, you can uh, remove the node, or and before that, you know, drain and remove uh, the, the pods as well. So one thing to know is uh, how do you actually make sure it's working? I think that's an important question, especially from the infra provider perspective. You can do simulation through different ways. One is actually doing dropping the GPUs in your testing. So you could run like NVIDIA SMI, drop commands to uh, drain one GPU if you have like multiple GPUs in your, on your node and see if that's uh, being detected properly. Or you could also do network, uh, re networking related load testing. So you run workload which takes up the bandwidth and then in your testing make sure that uh, your node conditions are correctly populated when you expect higher bandwidth. Uh, this is an interesting project called Quark, uh, which was talked about in the keynote yesterday, where you can use virtual nodes to simulate uh, your GPUs and also to simulate nodes in general. You can inject errors 
to your nodes and pod logs and see if that's being picked up by your components. I think this is very promising at, for the future, particularly for GPU testing because it's expensive to provision GPUs. Now I'm going to show a demo of these components coming together. And keep in mind, these are all open source and you can leverage it for multiple uh, infrastructures. Before I go into the demo, I want to summarize what we're going to see. We're going to have the custom GPU node problem detector, Drano, which is the remedy controller. And I'm going to do a simple test where I just drop the GPU uh, when I have eight GPUs in that uh, node. And I want to see the node condition show up. So I have an Azure Kubernetes service cluster. I'm adding an A100 node right there, which has eight GPUs. I'm also skipping the GPU driver installation because I want that to be handled by the GPU operator. You see, after fast forwarding, we've got the, the, the A100 node. And then when you look at the operator-related pods, you see that the driver ha installation has been completed as well. And when you describe the node, you will see a variety of information, including the node conditions there, which right now it's a completely healthy node. Uh, so you, know, you don't see any errors. The node conditions are false. Now I'm deploying the custom GPU node problem detector. The pod's been created. And it's going to be running GPU-related health checks. You will see that there are node conditions related to GPUs uh, and some events as well that, that were generated, which are GPU-specific. So here, things like the GPU count is correct is set to false, which is uh, a node condition which checks whether the expected number of GPUs, which is eight, matches what it actually sees. And the check is running NVIDIA SMI commands in the background. Then you also see other events uh, related to GPU health checks. Now this is a Drano configuration. Uh, here I have GPU-related uh, events and node conditions that I want to look at. So these like things like GPU counts are what I'm going to look at in this uh, deployment of Drano, and that's going to be used to drain the node when those conditions are set. So I've deployed Drano as well. And then we see the, G, uh, the, the Kubernetes node for A100 still is marked as ready. Now I'm going to go inside the driver pod, and then I'm going to go uh, drop the GPU. So now you see eight GPUs, zero indexed. And then I'm going to drop uh, with NVIDIA SMI commands one of those GPUs. And I'm also disabling persistence D there. So once I drop it, I'll, you'll see that there are seven GPUs, so zero to seven, or zero to six there. And then you'll see how uh, this is going to be picked up by the GPU node problem protector. You'll see the events are related to GPU count being bad as well. You're expected to see seven, but you see, expected to see eight, but you see seven. And then the node conditions are set as well uh, to indicate that you know, one of the GPUs is missing. And this is useful because some of this functionality is not provided by the device plugin because it just changes the allocatable, but you don't actually take actions based on these outputs. And then you see that you have a status which says scheduling disabled too. So from a user perspective, it's much easier now because you directly see just the nodes where there are issues, and the infra provider can take care of all of, all of these components. The challenge with this approach is that some of these checks depend on GPU and network-related config. They are very specific to particular GPUs. So doing it across the fleet is hard because you need to know the expected values for uh, these GPUs and the configuration. And that's possible to get, especially if you have APIs to the infra provider to get that information. Then you also need to make sure that the health checks that you're running consume minimal resources and don't affect the actual workloads because you don't want to have a check which is disrupting the workload itself. 
So things like NVIDIA SMI commands typically are not that resource in intensive, so it's fine to run them regularly, but some of the infinite band checks, for instance, might end up affecting the workload. So you have to be careful about when you run it, how frequently you run it. Then you also need to distinguish between actionable hardware issues, actionable software issues, and actual hardware issues. So the hardware issues, typically, you, know, you cannot fix them on the fly from your node, but there are certain components in, that can be fixed through restarts, for instance, or taking other actions on your node. So you need to differentiate between that, and that's complex, especially when you have many components uh, at the GPU layer involved. Going further, I want to share about some of the advanced developments in this field and what the potential or the main gaps are right now. Uh, this is a very nascent space. There's a lot of things going on uh, to make it easier to monitor GPUs because right now, customers often, and like end users typically have to think about failures, but you don't want them to think about it. Um, this is a great project called Checkpoint Restore in User Space for GPUs. Checkpoint Restore in User Space has been there for a while, and that's a way to migrate your live processes. And this has been extended to Checkpoint Containers. And there's a Kubernetes feature as well called Forensic Checkpointing, which was motivated for security reasons, but that can also be used for checkpointing your uh, container state. And then you can leverage features like that to be able to migrate your workloads easily. And just to be clear, this checkpointing is different from the model level checkpointing because model checkpointing is done by the application layer where you checkpoint the full model, but here it's checkpointing the entire container. So all of the memory, for instance, should be captured and restored. But it's, CRIU has been well tested for CPUs and it's being used in many places as well for that. But for GPUs, there's still more work to make it natively integrated with Kubernetes. There's open source projects from NVIDIA, for instance, where they are capturing the GPU state from, uh, from the node as well, like the CUDA state. It's called CUDA Checkpoint is the name of the open source project. And there's similar projects from AMD too. And the challenge with GPUs is that you need to capture the GPU state properly along with the rest of the CPU state and the memory and other parts of the process. Uh, then the, one of the root causes for the complexity also is that GPUs are not treated as a native resource in Kubernetes uh, compared to CPUs, for instance, and that leads to the need for more and more uh, custom integrations and checks and needing to integrate it with multiple components in Kubernetes. And there's a lot of work in the open source community that's trying to make it easier to uh, manage GPUs. I want to summarize the key takeaways from this presentation. First, uh, Sarah shared about why GPU failures are dis disruptive and expensive, and how for ML training in particular, that gets compounded, especially in terms of cost. Then we talked about multiple layers of health checks. We start off by application layer health checks that can be run before running the workload. This could be through init containers, or you could have more advanced workload specific checks which are actually looking at workload patterns throughout time. Then you could have orchestrator level checks where you're running at the Kubernetes layer or the HPC workload manager layer, some node health checks regularly in the background. And that can be done for faster detection and uh, migrating workloads. Then in terms of resolution, there's, you start off by checkpointing. It's a great practice to make sure your model weights are captured regularly and can be restored later. Uh, and then you also have remedy control systems along with the node problem detector that I mentioned earlier where you move workloads and take actions based on what you've detected uh, so that you can either fix the node or move your workload seamlessly to a different workload, a wo worker node. And then uh, you want to also make sure you prevent the node from being reused again uh, for other deployments. We briefly touched upon ongoing work in the field in terms of CRIU support for GPUs in Kubernetes and making GPU health more case native so that it's much more seamless to manage uh, GPU workloads on Kubernetes. 
Thank you, everyone. Uh, and we hope you have a great rest of the time in Hong Kong. We've also added more links to projects we've referenced. There's a lot of interesting projects in this space, and we'd recommend checking it out. And now we're open to questions. Thank you. Uh, one of the several GPUs or nodes are uh, just done because uh, driver issues or runtime issues or other compiler issues. Uh, so I want to know more about your uh, strategies. You will fall back to the previous checkpoint or you will continue uh, the training process. Uh, what is, I want to know more about your, uh, maybe your best practice. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think um, it depends on the, um, the error. Um, so if, you're, if you, your workloads can't run anymore, um, I think it should, be, it should be migrated. So you should uh, deschedule it. So that's the, the actions that we mentioned. And then, um, and then the node is um, like replaced or, uh, yeah, the node is replaced or repaired. So yeah, there are some actions that you can take to uh, actually, like um, you mentioned, like um, driver issues, so you can restart your driver, for example, um, to to save that. Um, so yeah, it depends on like the impact that it has on your workload. Uh, uh, if it's, if uh, assuming that it's uh, some uh, hardware uh, GPU issues, you have to replace it with a new GPU. So once you uh, replace the uh, broken GPU with the uh, correct GPU, uh, you have to start from the very beginning or you have other strategies? Yeah, no, so um, I think to, to maximize the efficiency of your training and your training platform, um, you don't want to lose the time that you spent uh, training um, before the, the issue happened. So um, that's why we mentioned checkpointing and it's also like uh, important um, for recovery to have an efficient checkpointing. Um, because that's then it decides how much time you, you lose basically for recovery. Uh, so you, um, so as I, as I mentioned before, you've got like um, automate, automated uh, checkpointing that can be done uh, on failure, on exception. Uh, so it saves the checkpoints. And then when you re-migrate the, the, the node, you will restore from that checkpoint. So you don't need to start over again. Uh, you can just um, pick up where you left off basically. Uh, but once you uh, fall back to the previous checkpoint, uh, I think, uh, for example, you have to reset the par training parameters like TP, PP size again. It, it will cost some extra time. Or you have some, uh, you have some better solutions to uh, just start the training uh, once you have uh, replaced the uh, broken GPU. You, you have anything uh, special to uh, reduce the, uh, uh, I mean, the restoring time. Mm. Yeah. So, I think your questions focus a lot, like it's very application specific, right? Because you have the, at the application layer is where you specify how to restore uh, checkpoints, right? And how you also um, make sure that you efficiently push the checkpoints. Oh, yes. I think there is work that's done in terms of um, like even within the broader Microsoft to okay. make sure that you can checkpoint and upload uh, your checkpoints faster. Okay. So that's uh, one, one level of efficiency in terms of being able to efficiently checkpoint okay. and restore from those model checkpoints. So th okay. this would be at the application layer, but okay. it's, there's also ways to uh, speed that part of the process. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but, but even if you can go back to and reload the previous mm -hmm, checkpoints, mm -hmm. uh, but it should cost a lot of time, especially for the large models, like uh, models larger than GPT-3, right? Loading, downloading, it has cost some time. Do you have any better solutions to 
Yeah, actually, I love that that part because I worked on a project related to that before. It's called Artifact Streaming, and it leverages this open source project called Overlay BD, and that's mainly to do lazy image pulling, so you can speed up pod start times, uh, and that that's one way to just get what you need when you need it. So let's say you are trying to create, um, you know some workload where you don't need most of the contents in your container image, assuming you're using a container image for your workload, then you don't need to download the entire container image before st you start to run it. So that's one way in which we speed up your uh, process to start running your workload again. And then there's also additional layers there. So you could do P2P uh, to speed it up, where you pick up your other image content from other nodes in your uh, cluster, so that you don't need to download it from a remote storage, which is much further away. That's the, the next layer where you optimize it further. Then there's some features which are a little specific to um, your actual cluster configuration and your cloud provider, where you end up um, having nodes with the images sort of pre-warmed as well, where you already have sort of some backup nodes where you have the container image. And there's some features which you can use to make that easy to use so that the next node that you pick up has those images cached already. Okay. Um, so that also speeds up your, your workload. And there's a few more things that you can do to, to speed up uh, those okay. starts. Okay, I see. But there should be some uh, uh, difficulties because, well, for example, uh, even if you can replace a new GPU you know, but the device ID or node ID is, the uh, rank mm -hmm. ID is different, right? In the uh, mm -hmm. high torch level or deep speed level, you, you have to, uh, I think it's harder for you to just uh, insert these new ideas into the whole pipeline, right? You, you have to restart your, your work from the previous checkpoint, actually, right? Yeah, uh, we'll get to that, but just one uh, survey before. Are there more questions, just to be respectful of the time, but we'll definitely are interested in sharing. Okay, uh, we can continue the conversation later, but quick answer there is that there are, also operators that you can leverage to make that process seamless so that you have these, and so if you have these configurations as environment variables, it can be picked up later. So you, you may be familiar with things like Kubray operator and PyTorch related operators. Those can typically be leveraged, but I think for your specific case, uh, we can also talk more to see if we have some best practices to, to share. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yes, one more question, thank you. Um, thank you very much for the awesome presentation. So um, one question I have is, um, what are the patterns of slowdowns that you have um, experienced? Like um, GPU bandwidth slowdown, of course, but um, maybe temperature changes cause the GPU to forego itself. Um, is there any advice around like, how do we detect if we are doing training or if we are doing inference um, the slowdown of the GPU is like observable and how do we, what kind of metrics or KPI we should observe in, in this case? So, thank you. Yeah, so mm, that's one area that's, that's, um, we haven't like fully covered yet in terms of automation and remediation, um, but it's something that we observed in the logging. So um, in the training logging, we have the number of iterations per second um, and that gives you, um, for like a specific size of a mod model and batch size and everything, it, it tells you exactly like um, if, they, if they're the same. Uh, during two training runs, um, the iteration should be the same for um, when they run on similar um, platform. Um, but we noticed that they, um, you do like six times less iterations per second, basically. So that's how we noticed it. Currently, we don't really have anything to um, detect that uh, and uh, other than lo the logs. One thing to add there as well is that from uh, an infra perspective, we have some signals from the GPUs, but then there definitely sh should be a better way in terms of knowing the source of truth of like what exactly is the slowdown measure, like how is it uh, being, I guess, propagated upwards, right? We need to know the underlying cause for that. And rather, you know, what Sarah mentioned is at the, very, at the application layer where you see the actual impact, but ideally we want it to be at the GPU level itself, where we need to have a signal which just tells us, hey, this is an indicator of slowdown, 
and you want to report it up. I think there's gaps, and it's also very GPU specific based on which vendor you use, for instance. And that's something that we want to work with the vendors to figure out okay, which, which signals we can use to be able to automatically detect it, uh, and then do those detection at the cloud layer so that the application layer does not need to uh, worry about impact there. Yeah, yeah, great question. Yeah, thank you all. Oh, there's one more, one more question. Yeah, I think this should be the last one because we are past time. Uh, so, uh, if one GPU uh, device is uh, fail, then maybe we have to uh, reschedule the. At least we will scale one port, or we have to restart all the job. Um, maybe um, uh, so. We, uh, if the port is restarted in another uh, host, then on another host, then they have to download the checkpoint and recover. And I think this time cost, right? So maybe uh, can uh, can we make some uh, uh, cascading recovery mechanism that maybe for some errors that uh, the the training framework may, can can ignore the errors, then they just. Uh, uh, we can uh, make some notice to the. We have some mechanism to notice the the, the training framework to uh, know that there is an error, but make, maybe they can ignore it. And then, uh, so for some errors, maybe we can recover the the GPU by restarting. Then we we start the port uh, on the same node. And then they don't have to uh, download the checkpoint file. Maybe the recovery uh, procedure may, may, uh, will be uh, faster, right? Yeah, uh, great question. I think there's definitely uh, errors which are ignored and which are not. So from the device plugin itself, there's a set of errors from the application layer which are ignored. Right? And then when you run your GPU node health uh, checks as well, you can decide which errors to ignore or not right? at the infra layer. And at the application layer, it's, or the framework layer, it's always decided by the framework itself in terms of choosing which uh, errors to ignore and which ones should not be ignored. Uh, but then, I guess, in terms of I can going back to the infra layer where you have this remedy controllers, depending on the type of error, you can also choose to uh, make take minimal actions, and if it's satisfied, then your workload can just continue running uh, in the same node, so you don't have to pull the, the pod again. Right? So it's all. But, but currently, we don't have that mechanism. Right? So uh, we have to train the node or or uh, reschedule the pod, right? Yeah, so it, it depends on the remedy controller implementation, right? So okay. there's I, uh, another question is that uh, how do the remedy controller to uh, restart the port on the or, or restart the node on because uh, we must have something running on the node to, yeah. to restart it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so there should, must have been an agent that that already exists in many cloud providers typically, okay. uh, where you have like in Azure Kubernetes Service, for instance, there is a component called the remediator, which uh, takes actions for things like you know, container D being down, for instance. It has privileged permissions to, to do okay, those changes. OK, thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you all so much. And we appreciate how passionate you are at, at this time, too. And we can see that you love uh, this topic. So thanks, everyone, for 